Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third day of hope. And we're very glad that everyone's here. And we're looking forward to the closing ceremonies tonight. Please join us. It'll be a blast. And on to our next speaker. Everyone in this room has pushed their bodies too far at some point in their lives. And everyone here knows what happens when your body nopes out. For example, if you go without sleep, you collapse. Our next speaker, though, has a novel solution to optimizing performance of our bodies in this hectic, chaotic, modern world. Please welcome Kenji Larson. Thanks very much. So my talk is biological time hacking. Um, I make a lot of devices, and I have a lot of projects, and I basically never have enough time to do all the things I want. So, um, and because I make devices, sometimes people say, you know what you really should do is just build a time machine. Well, I don't really know how to do that, but um, I thought about it a little bit, and I realized, you know, the type of time machine where you travel around in time, go back and forward and do things, not only a lot of problems with that just in general, but um, uh, it's not the kind of time machine I want. The type of time machine I want is one that produces more time, right? So, um, but let's take a look. The components here are biological, time, and hacking. Now, I say biological because I, I'm actually pretty obsessed with process in general, and uh, I realized uh, there are other types of time hacking that you can do, organizational time hacking, uh, psychological time hacking. I have plenty to say about those things, but uh, the one, the like, sort of underserved type of time hacking is really biological, so that's what this is about. Uh, hacking is an important uh, part of this talk, not just because of this conference, but also uh, it's about using your time for your purposes. And I think that's really important because uh, what I'm not here to tell you is, uh, you know, eat regular meals, get some exercise, sleep well, and, you know, you'll, you'll add like seven days to the end of your life. You know, that's not really my purpose. So my purpose is if you want more time in the day or for a particular week because you've got a project to do or you have some uh, idea of how you want to spend your time, then you should just do that. Uh, but this is not a talk about your health. It's not a talk about, uh, 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 you know, about uh, not trying to die or something like this. It's really just uh, however you would like to use the time you have or you think you have, uh, here's how to do it more efficiently. And so um, I think time is actually our most valuable asset. And we, our language really uses a lot of that stuff, uh, a lot of, um, excuse me, a lot of um, phrases that are equivalent uh, to things that have value. So you, you hear us spending time, you hear us saving time, and you've heard time is money. Well, I think there's some differences. This is the arrow of time. It only goes in one direction, never goes back. Here's the arrow of money, which you may have seen recently. I put a little positive note at the end, so hopefully things will go. But the point is that money is flexible. You can, get, uh, you can lose your money, and you can get more money back. But once you've lost your time, you can never get that back. That is just spent. So in my opinion, time is much more valuable than money. Time is not equal to money. So let's look at this year. Here's a representation of this year. This is every day this year. All of the red squares indicate um, uh, days that are, have gone by. The yellow square is uh, where we are today. And the blue squares indicate all the rest of this year. And uh, that's the future. Now. The funny thing about that is that while the past has been determined, the future has not. So therefore, you actually can't count on all of these blue squares. It's actually, uh, you know, I, I might get hit by a bus tomorrow and not have all of these blue squares. So I think it's very important uh, for me to maximize my use of time in the ways that I want to. And by the way, it doesn't mean that I just have to be working on projects. I can be use that time for relaxing or something else. So just to be clear, freedom of choice for your use of time. But let's look at this year in the context of my life. Here we are. These are all the days of my life. Uh, and in the past, you can see all red. Uh, you can see I'm way over the hump as, uh, as per expect expected time. The blue is the future that is predicted by average lifespan in the US. OK, not totally relevant, maybe, for me. But, uh, uh, so, but again, it could be much, much shorter, and it could be much, much longer. The green squares indicate the future that is past the average, so it might be a, you know, some kind of awesome future. 
uh, where I live long. Many people live to 100 nowadays, so that might be a possibility for me, but again, I might meet that bus tomorrow. So um, the other thing that can happen in the blue area or the green area is that uh, I live long enough to allow technology uh, to provide things like 3D printed organs, uh, pharmaceuticals, you know, other types of science and technology and technology innovations that allow me to increase my health span and my lifespan. And that way I'll get more time. But I'm not going to tell you about that because that's not hacking. I, this, I'm trying to hack the system that we have right now and hopefully I'll live long enough by doing that to get to that future. Here's this year. Think about it. Okay, the things we spend time on. Breathing, eating, drinking, eliminating the things we've consumed, sleeping, and also focusing. Now, focusing is actually something that uh, has biological inputs. You can absolutely be distracted if you didn't sleep right, uh, and, and it, it impairs your ability to focus. So we'll talk about that from a biological perspective. But then there's all the things that you might be focusing on. Work, vo your vocation, hobbies, your obligations, self-actualization, relaxation. Uh, you know, socializing, any, any, of it, any, anything you basically uh, can think of that you do during your life. Uh, but the difference is that the things on the left are biological inputs. They're things that you absolutely must do. Your body will absolutely not continue if you don't do these things. And that even includes focusing. The brain needs information to stay lively, etc. cetera. Um, these other things are things you choose. When I say that, I don't mean there are always things that you actively choose, like you know, you're know you dealing with some car accident you just got in through no fault of your own. Okay, you didn't choose that, but you did choose to drive that day. You know, From a meta level, these are the activities that you do in your life, as opposed to the activities on the left, which you can't help but do, and which, uh, and which are actually uh, higher in priority for the body. So whatever you decide to do on the right, can be absolutely interrupted at any time by the things on the left that your body decides is more important than your choices. And that's why biological time hacking is actually uh, a really important place to look. All of these things have a process in time where you have a, a warm up kind of uh, period where you're doing stuff, you might be acquiring matter, acquiring ingredients, um, or just focusing on you know, wh you know where are you gonna get your mindset and so forth, and then you, have a process, and that process can be uh, digesting food, it can be uh, reading the book you're, you've decided to read, you know, I, you've gotten the book, now you've read the book, and then there's some kind of cleanup or regroup, and then you're ready to do the next thing or the same thing again. Uh, you put the book down, and then pick it back up, whatever it is. So all of these things have a serial time structure. And notice this is the arrow of time uh, depicted. Um, let's take a look at breathing, for instance. First you inhale, some gas exchange in your lungs, then you exhale. Okay, easy. Uh, but let's look a little closer, because actually there's two processes there in terms of biology. One is that you need to get oxygen. Your body requires oxygen. So you're obtaining the oxygen by inhaling. And then when the oxygen is in your lungs, it is absorbed into the blood. And then basically, in order to uh, obtain more oxygen, you now have to reset the whole body. That includes doing the entire other exhale process, but basically you have to reset your body to be able to inhale again. So that's the cleanup aspect. But concurrently, I shouldn't say concurrently, but really after the inhale portion, the reset lungs part actually has another process in contained, which is to get rid of your waste gas. So your CO2 is, again, the air is in your lungs, it is now uh, being exchanged with the blood, the carbon dioxide comes out, and now you, and now you have, uh, gotten rid when you exhale of the CO2. But in order to get rid of more CO2, guess what? You have to inhale again. You have to reset the, the, the body in, in to be able to do that. So I don't want to spend too much on that, but you, you get what's, what's happening here. Um, the main point here is that these processes are mutually exclusive. You cannot inhale while exhaling, uh, and they are serial in time. So there's no parallelism here. You can't, you, there's nothing you can do. You just simply have to do them one or the other, and you alternate. Now, fortunately for us, breathing is autonomic. We don't have to think about it at all. So the beautiful thing is that we can do breathing in parallel with everything else that we do. 
eating and drinking and eliminating that which we've consumed is a similar process if you think of it that way. You have to obtain the matter, you have to digest the matter, incorporate it into your body, and then you uh, let go of the uh, waste processes. Same thing, exactly. Um, this, on the other hand, uh, is a little bit different because the, um, whereas you have uh, essentially one orifice for uh, breathing, you have other orifices and uh, they, it doesn't enforce a mutual exclusion. Now you could ingest while eliminating, you know, parallelism, save a little time, I guess. So there's, there's one hack for you. Uh, it's not a major one, not a major one. So we'll get to that. Sleeping is the big one. Sleeping is the big one. Third of your life spent sleeping. Uh, and this is one of those biological things that we need to do, but it absolutely enforces your body not being able to do all those other things that you choose, unless, of course, you chose to sleep, which is fine. But um, the prep is you get tired, you get a little sleepy, you know, you go to sleep, then you're in your cycles of sleep, and then, you know, hours pass. There's, you see, here's the rich treasure trove of time. Hours are passing while you're sleeping. And then you spend some time waking up, and you know, you might be a little groggy or whatever. Okay, there's a process. Um, this process is actually uh, many, many processes together, some of which aren't fully understood. We think that there's a period of time where you just relax and you unfocus a little bit, and which is why you can't get to sleep if you're stressed and thinking about something. You're not, you're still focused on the thing. You need to unfocus first, then you need to unlearn some of the irrelevant details from the day so your important memories are remain permanent. You can also um, you know, uh, rebuild energy uh, in some of your cells that you've expended during the day, and there's some cellular repair. Uh, you know, sleep is really important. You need it for repair. Uh, and then when you wake up, then you're energized, you're rested, you're attentive, and this is a cyclical thing that uh, happens uh, once a day, but, um, but you can hack that. So we'll talk about that. Focusing, same thing. When you're acquiring what you're gonna, about to be focused on, there's a process. You know, like, oh, where's my pen and where's my paper and, you know, or where are my glasses? All these things you have to do to sit down to do your task. Then you do your task and you might be, this task might be anything uh, that you choose to do. So there's choice, but there's biological aspects to this. If you, uh, you can do things to increase your focus, like take things like caffeine or uh, L-tyrosine. Uh, and by the way, when I say these things, it's an option for some people and maybe not an option for other people. Everyone is different and age dependent. There's all these reasons why. So you have to do what makes sense for you and what you know. Also, sensitivities to things like caffeine, for instance, are different for, for people. I'm highly acclimated to using caffeine, so it's no problem for me, but someone who doesn't drink, let's say, coffee regularly may not, may have, may have a harder time. They may be jittery and stuff, and then they can't focus. It might be counter-purpose. So I'm not making any recommendation, uh, but I'm just saying there are things you can do to, uh, to bi like biologically do, to increase your ability to focus. Um, and then when you put the task down, you park it and then go on to the next thing. And we'll, we'll get into to that. That's important. Um, but here's a real problem. Here is a huge time waste during the day, is context switching. You're sitting down, you're doing your task, and you are interrupted. Well, you, you've instantly parked what you've done to go deal with whatever just happened. The, you know, some, something fell, whatever, someone came in the door, your phone rang, whatever it is, or you know, smart mess, smartphone notifications, you looked at it, now where was I? I don't remember. It can be up to 20 minutes before you can then reacquire all of the things that you were focusing on to, to then actually do the task again. So if you are reading and you get interrupted, it might only be one minute, but it could be 20 minutes before you really have the mental capacity to pick up where you left off. Now where was it again? Did I even read that last paragraph? You know, this type of thing. 20 minutes. So if you think about our modern life with all the interruptions, this is where a lot of it occurs. A lot of it. Optimizations are available here too. I mentioned uh, that you can use stimulants uh, to increase focus and other things. Also, you know, uh, be well rested. Um, dietary, other dietary things you can do to, to increase your focus. We can talk about that a little bit later on. But essentially, uh, there's two things here. One is to prevent interruption so that the total time, the, the total time of acquiring goes down. 
in a serial task because you're doing this numbers numbers of times, uh, even a small savings is important, and then shortening the total time of the task by being more uh, more focused or more able to do the task. So I have other things uh, uh, to talk about there with uh, physical coordination, hand-eye coordination. You can make yourself more efficient that way. We can talk about that at the end. Um, try to leave. I'm going to try to leave a bit of time for uh, Q and A. The important thing here is serial versus parallel. If you have something that happens over and over and over again, even shaving a tiny bit of time off of that uh, matters. So if you think about like, um, like so for instance, <laughs> I drink a lot of coffee, maybe five cups a day, maybe more. Um, but what I realized was that I was waiting about two minutes each time for a cup of coffee. So that amounts to about 10 minutes a day. When you're standing there waiting for the coffee, it's only two minutes. And that is an insidious tax, because what happens is, yeah, it's only two minutes, I'll wait, whatever, it's fine. But the thing is, 10 minutes a day, 300 minutes a month, now you're talking real time, right? Now I add that up over, remember the big thing with um, all the days of my life? That's a long period of time, waiting for coffee. So I'd rather not do that. Uh, so I would rather actually shave off a little bit of time. Can I make it one minute? Can I make it half a minute? And I, I did. I'm a device maker, so I made a coffee maker that detects my presence and um, starts its routine before I get there. And so shaved a little bit of time, uh, and I like that. Um, so parallelism is really important. If you can do two things at the same time, like if I could do something while I was waiting for the coffee, then I wouldn't have to do them serially. And so, I mean, that's just obvious, I think. So, um, okay, we'll get to the next. So here are the things the body needs to take in. Oxygen, nutrients, and I'm gonna divide this into water and then all the other matter. Um, and I do that because uh, matter actually is a little bit harder to take in and takes a little bit more cognitive load than uh, drinking liquids. And that's gonna be an important hack. Light, super important. Might not even realize this because we don't even talk about it anymore uh, because we have light whenever we want it, on demand, night or day, doesn't matter. But the body is really, really, really sensitive to light. And the fortunate thing is light is on demand. We can control it if we want to. And so this is where a lot of the big hacking is because your body responds to light in different ways. And I'm, I, I think you've probably heard a lot about this with circadian rhythm and blue blocking glasses and, and, you know, in the uh, literature. But um, I'll tell you exactly what it's about uh, because this is where you can achieve most of the time. And then information. Uh, information is very important to keep the mind going and, uh, and all the biology around the brain going. And when I say information, it actually goes right back to light because the brain is the thing that takes up the most of the human body's energy and the visual cortex of the brain is the, is the piece of the brain that takes up the even more, I mean, or not even more, but the, mo the, the lion's share of all that because it's processing so much information. So let's take a look versus time spent, oxygen, breathing. Great, we already established breathing is highly parallelized. We don't even think about it, so great, nothing to think about there. Uh, with water, with drinking, you can take a sip of something, you're jogging, you're biking, whatever, or reading a book, you take a sip, you don't even think about it, it's fairly parallelized. You do have to obtain the liquid at some point and you know, set it up and whatever, fine. Try to shorten that time. Um, eating, a lot harder, a lot harder. You have to correlate a lot of different things and then if you couple it with a social interaction, then you have to manage other people's schedules and then there's ordering and or, you know, or cooking or whatever it is that you're trying to do. It's gonna take some time. However, that might be what you might want to spend your time on, so please do, but then you can maybe want to maximize the amount of time that you spend eating because you get this double benefit. Now you're parallelizing. You might be socializing, but you also might be getting nutrients. Light, everything we do, right? We're always bathed in light. Even at night, there's light. There's some kind of light, either uh, all kinds of lights, actually. We'll get into that, actually. Uh, and uh, information, also everything. So. <laughs> this is where the hacking comes in because you can, since everything is, ma is, is, is impinging upon this, any change you make to almost anything uh, can help you here. So this is called the circadian rhythm. Circa means approximately, uh, diem is day, so about a day. So this cycle is about a day, about a day long. And definitely your biological organism has this rhythm. It definitely does things and, it do and it's, um, it, 
happens by light entrainment. So we we just we are bio biological organisms, as are many other animals that uh, uh, follow this cycle. Uh, they might do different things during this cycle, but the light dark light dark of day night day night is actually extremely important and totally totally baked into our body and our organism and our brain. Brain also part of the body, just to be clear. So highly biological. Um, this is a very interesting graphic because it really shows you that there are real, really different spots during the day. So for instance, in the, when you, after you wake up and you are awake, that's the period of time when you have the most energy because you haven't spent it yet. You've just spent all this time sleeping. And so it, this is a great time for cognitive tasks. High alertness, you can see. And then you might, so you might want to choose tasks that you're going to do or want to do that uh, couple with this type of activity in the morning. Um, and then in the afternoon, you have much more cardiovascular efficiency, but maybe you have less analytical ability at that time. So you might want to choose tasks that uh, map to that better during the afternoon. And that, that's working with your cycle. And I, I just want to say that this is a, even though it says midnight and noon, um, that's really a throwback in a way to our roots, which is that, yes, it used to be midnight and noon, but we have rooms where we can block the shades, you know, block the sun out and put on any kinds of light that we want. And, um, and therefore it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be uh, uh, mapped to daylight. It can be mapped to our artificial control of light. But here's the problem, modern life, uh, has us having very dim days and very um, bright, comparatively bright nights compared to the natural darkness of real night, uh, even with the moon. Um, so look around you. This is a kind of a dim room. If you think of how bright it is outside, I mean, even on a cloudy day, it might be 20,000 lux as a unit of measurement, and in here it might only be 200. 1%. 5%, you know, you turn the lights up a little and it's 5%, but it's never, almost never 10% of what you're gonna get outside. But guess what? Our biology expects it to be really bright. There are cheats around this, so we'll get to that. But at night, we have all kinds of overhead lights, we've got screens and we've got phones, television, all kinds of things that are, uh, that are basically illuminating us at times when, we, when our body does not expect it and it has real uh, real consequences with our sleep schedule. The human eye is the organ that actually is coordinating this light information. Even when the eyelids are closed, especially red light can penetrate through the eyelids and get to the retinas. And even though the skin, for instance, is light sensitive, you obviously can go get a tan, so your this giant organ of the skin is responding to light, it is photosensitive. Uh, and there are things that you, that you get from that, vitamin D and stuff like this, that uh, vitamin D affects. Um, it's really the eye that gives you this chronology information, not the skin. So managing your eyesight and what you're looking at and what types of lights you uh, take into your eye, directly or indirectly, because it's not about image recognition. It's not about focusing and seeing something clearly. It's actually just about what photons are hitting the receptors in your retina, focused or unfocused. There's your retina, and in this retina are a few different kinds of photoreceptors. Uh, you may have all heard of rods and cones. Rods are the things that basically perceive brightness, and cones are the things that basically perceive color. Uh, can get into the mechanism of that if you like later. Uh, but then there's this other one that you probably haven't heard of, which are the IPRGCs. That's their, that stands for uh, Intrinsically Photosensitive Retinal Ganglion Cells. So too bad they didn't come up with a really short name like rods and cones so I could talk about it. But these are the receptors that exist that do not uh, support uh, optical vision. You don't see anything. You don't it doesn't produce uh, an image in your mind. But what it does do is it tells the brain what time of day it is, what time of day your body thinks it is. Here are the rods, uh, I'm sorry, the cones, the color cones, there's three types, and this is the color spectra that they can absorb. You might notice there's a giant gap there in the blue region. Um, 
But basically, mixing these three colors gets you, uh, the, the eye can see about 10 million uh, separate colors, about, which is interesting because most of our screens can do 16 million, but can't see all of the differences at the lowest levels of resolution, or the highest levels. Um, but this is a photopigment called melanopsin, and that's the thing that is absorbing light in a different uh, frequency range. So if you take a look here, the melanopsin curve is in between the S cone and the M cone, and that is the thing, that is the blue light that everyone thinks is so bad that, they, that you need to wear blockers for. The truth is, and by the way, that's at approximately, it peaks at around 480 nanometers uh, wavelength. It goes from about 464 to 482 uh, in the literature. There's, an, I mean, there's probably just variation as well. Um, but this is the area where your body is uh, understanding that it's daytime. And you should do things like secrete melatonin or suppress melatonin secretion. You are able to become sleepy or become very alert. Uh, adenosine in your body also uh, accrues when you're sleeping. Uh, and uh, when you're awake, uh, it, it gets depleted. Uh, actually, there's an interesting thing about this. Uh, caffeine is an adenosine antagonist. And so what that means is it will uh, prevent you uh, from, prevent the adenosine from doing its sleepiness trick on you. And that's why you can stay awake. If you just keep drinking the coffee, you, the, that adenosine is not free to make you sleepy. The moment the caffeine wears off and is metabolized, all of a sudden all the excess adenosine is there and now all of a sudden you have that 3 p.m. afternoon crash. That's what it's about. So understanding these mechanisms and, um, and mixing them with the, use of the correct use of light uh, is a, a great way to uh, find more time because when I'm crashed out at in the, 3 in the afternoon, I can't do anything that I choose. It's really my biology saying, you can't do anything else. Now your adenosine is taken over. So this blue light is uh, being absorbed by the melanopsin and uh, being converted into circadian information for the brain. And it's the thing that tells you to be alert. So in the morning, you actually really do want blue light. And if you have bright blue light, not 200 lux, but 20,000 lux, you will be quite alert. And it's a purely biological effect. But you can use it. You can intentionally have a seasonal affected disorder lamp that produces 10,000 lux and, and uh, have a better mood, higher focus, but just general alertness and attentiveness and be more efficient about your day. And your tasks will go faster as well. Um, at night, however, you don't want to get excited by this blue light. And that's where the blue blockers come in and the night vision on your computer and on your phone, if you have that. Uh, it's very good to use those things because you don't want to trigger your body to say, hey, is, is it daylight? Maybe I should wake up. And then that makes your sleep less efficient. And then you might need more cycles of sleep to get the energy restoration that you need. So this sleep and light is what's called a Zeitgeber. That's uh, from the German and uh, means literally time giver. And originally it was used as, uh, I'm gonna give you the time like a metronome and the sun going up and down is the metronome beat for your body. But I like to think of it as the time giver. It's the thing, the technique that allows to give you time. Um, and so we're back to this cycle. You can see, uh, you can tweak this quite a bit if you, uh, if you extend certain periods using the correct light. But we'll, we'll talk exactly about it. Um, I just want to show you this. There's uh, data that show that some people are really s differently sensitive to um, light than others. Uh, it could be 50 times difference. So you might be extremely sensitive to sunlight uh, or just light in general, and there may be a great effect, or you might be able to be relatively insensitive to light. So not all these techniques are going to work for everyone, and the amount of light you might need to trigger one of these things might be more or less depending on your own biology, your individual biology. Now, here's where uh, cutting up your time into manageable modular sections is going to help you. Uh, 90 minutes, 90 minutes is your friend. That's the, that's the time period you should think about. Uh, it governs a lot of processes in the body. The first one I'm going to talk about is sleep. Here is one sleep cycle. 
what happens here is you uh, are awake, you're awake, that's the W, and then you get into certain levels of sleep. You st the R is um, rapid eye movement sleep. It's where a lot of stuff happens. Uh, but you really skip it when you go to sleep, when the initial portions of sleep. And that, that's really important to understand because if you don't spend 90 minutes sleeping, you take a 15-minute power nap, they're very good. There's ways to do it, uh, such as drink a cup of coffee right before sleeping, and then before it kicks in, you can then sleep and get your energy restoration, but then the caffeine kicks in and will wake you up prior to getting to that. So you, if you ha only have time for a very small amount of energy restoration, that's a technique you can use. And I think that's called the Jap Japanese coffee nap. I think they invented it, but I did not invent it. But I use it, and it works. But the key thing here is that this does not interrupt the circadian cycle because you don't ever get to that uh, rapid eye movement sleep at the end because you've interrupted it before 90 minutes. However, if you sleep for 90 minutes, you can actually get to this spot and not have to sleep as much at night in a big sleep because you've already done some of this work. Here's a hours of sleep overnight, seven, eight, nine hours. You know, it varies, and the cycle time varies. By, by the way, when I said 90 minutes, it's not exactly 90 minutes. It's about 90 minutes, so it depends. It's going to depend on you. It's going to depend on a variety of things, including, like, what you ate and how much, you know, metabolism you, you've got, this type of thing. So uh, there's some variance, but 90 minutes is the approximate gauge. Um, What's interesting here is that there are many of these 90-minute cycles during sleep. And uh, my hack, I'm just going to just tell you right, right now, is to understand how many of these things uh, uh, you have. And then when you're close to wakefulness, you can see in the middle of this chart, you're actually awake a little bit. You might not remember it because, you know, you wake up and, oh, nothing, and you go right back to sleep. You spend almost no time awake. But that is your opportunity right there to actually just wake up if you want to, and there's ways to do that, which we'll talk about. Uh, and then you can sleep a lot less. But anyway, the point is you're controlling your sleep. But don't try to wake up at, you know, 120 minutes in. It really has to be a multiple of around 90 minutes, and you can tune that in for yourself as you, as you figure yourself out. So, yeah, approximately a third of your life just sleeping. You can't do anything while you're sleeping, or can you? Well, there are opportunities for parallelism during sleep. So of all those things that I mentioned, you probably can't do things like your hobbies or any of that stuff. But there are some things you can do. You can actually um, go to the bathroom while you're sleeping. And when I say that, uh, I, I mean like not you know, while you're in bed, but like you, your, your natural body processes wake you up at one of those 90-minute cycles when you're near wakefulness, and your body says, hey, you know, I got to go. And so what do you do? You, Depends, but you, you, you go, right? Uh, and you go back to sleep. It's not a, big, not a big problem. But the thing is, that occurred while you were sleeping. And yes, you were awake while you were asleep, while you were in that sleep cycle. So it's a, maybe a technical difference, but essentially during your big sleep cycle, you could do that. And so you already know that you can do that. But the thing that you shouldn't do is turn on the overhead lights to see where you're walking to because that's the thing that triggers the circadian system, and then the rest of your sleep is kind of like not as good and not as efficient, and then you will need more sleep. But if you have a nice red light in the, in, if I, I'll show you later, but uh, a 650 nanometer red wavelength and above, it doesn't trigger any of that blue stuff or any of the, uh, also, there's other frequencies where it's just um, brightness that can trigger the circadian system. But if you have a red light at night and it's bright, you can actually see because your red uh, absorbing cones can absolutely make a visual image. You can see everything and it's bright and it's red, but your melanopsin, your IPRGCs that uh, are translating that into the circadian rhythm, don't see it at all. Absolutely invisible. So it does not wake you up. It keeps your sleep efficient. You can keep it short. And now, guess what? You're awake while you're asleep. So you can do certain things. I, found, I tried to eat while I was sleeping. I tried to drink while I was sleeping. I had a very hard time with eating because it's very cogni cognitively difficult to do these things. And also, food is another zeitgeber. We tend to feed while we're awake and in the daytime. And that tells the body, when you're eating something, it tells the body, oh, time to wake up. So I found out that chewing things and creating a salivary response, not good. That doesn't work at all but you can drink stuff. It just goes down, doesn't matter. 
And if you have water, you can add a little sugar, you can add a little protein, as long as it's tasteless and doesn't have kind of a, you know, a, a, a triggering effect for the brain. Uh, I mean, that works for me. It may not work for everybody, but you can have something. And if you do that, then when you wake up, guess what? You're less hungry. You might be able to skip breakfast, which I do all the time. And I don't think it's unhealthy to do so. I eat lunch, okay, so. Uh, and it's, pl it's sufficient. But in other words, I've just freed up all that time to do something else, focus on something. There are opportunities for fewer sleep cycles because if you do it this way and you're efficient at going to sleep and, uh, and, and getting up, and then, uh, and then you're aware of your body's propensity to wake up in the middle of, your, in the middle of the long sleep at the wakefulness periods, uh, you can actually interrupt, intentionally interrupt yourself there. One way to do that is by doing the thing I just said, which is drinking some stuff. If you drink a lot of stuff, your body is going to want to make you get up. And so when you're up, if you realize that you are up because you've gone to eliminate, uh, you can just stay up because you're if you've timed it right, you've had enough sleep at that point, and you can always choose to have a, another mini sleep that's more than 90 minutes, nine minutes or more uh, uh, later on in the day if you like. It's up to you to how, however you like to optimize it. It's not always convenient to take a nap, so. But you can definitely do with less sleep. Or I can, I should say, rephrase, I can do with less sleep. Might be different for you. Um, and then there are opportunities with sleep to increase the serial efficiency. So uh, I don't use blue, blue lights in that, in that uh, uh, period of time before going to sleep, and therefore I can sleep very fast. I, don't, I, don't, I also use some mental techniques to uh, really n not stress out and you know, just try to uh, go to sleep quickly, uh, and I can probably sleep in less than two minutes. Uh, so, all that, so instead of like, you know, all of these, uh, you know, all this time spent, you know, we're, we're thinking about the day, whatever, just intentionally, don't do that. Try to really, you know, have a nice meal, relax, start the unfocusing ahead of time, don't use any blue lights, and, and you, the sleep pressure you, your body naturally has because the melatonin has started to build up already will allow you to fall right asleep. And so that becomes very efficient. And then when you wake up, you can use a blue light and that will uh, more quickly bring you into alertness. But guess what? There's another thing you can do. You can use the lights before you wake up. I told you, the eyelids, translucent, right? The light goes in. So what happens is, if you, if you can build a device that has a, a timer on it or, or, or get one and start uh, illuminating your room that you're sleeping in prior to you waking up, the body will actually register this while you're sleeping. So now you're waking while you're sleeping. And so when you actually do get fully awake, you are much more alert than when you, you were, and then you can just go about your day. You don't have to spend all that time becoming awake. And I suggest that you actually delay caffeine uh, once you wake up. Uh, sometimes you wake up and you want to just get that coffee to get that attentiveness. It's true, but remember what I said about it being an adenosine antagonist that'll bite you later. If you let the adenosine clear out for a little bit before you get that cup of coffee, you're going to do better over the course of the day. Just back to this, I want to show you, you know, you can try to interrupt at the, at the different times, uh, and you'll have to see what works for you. Okay, remember this? Focus. Focusing, uh, you can't focus on stuff for really more than 90 minutes just biologically. Sure, you can, you can think, you, I focused on that all day long. Well, not really. You actually focused it on for 90 minutes, max, and then you, you, your body just can't because the chemicals in your body, the dopamine, uh, and other things that you, you have uh, in your body while you're focusing just get depleted. You need to relax after 90, 90 minutes. So if you know this, that's great. Don't schedule a task you think is, you really need super focus for for you know, three hours. That's just not going to work. Um, you can chop it into two hour and a half blocks and then put something in between that allows you to replenish. Maybe a 15 minute Japanese coffee nap or something else. So food, again, I mentioned to you, it's a Zeitgeber. It tells you, uh, it tells you when, uh, along with light, when, what time of day it is and what your body ought to be doing. But it's uh, totally necessary. Obviously, we need to have energy, and this is how we derive it. Um, so yes, it's a Zeitgeber. So be careful when you're using food with respect to the sleep cycle you want to have 
because they can run counter to each other or they can run together with each other. And, uh, and so it's just about whatever purpose you want. If you want to eat less or sleep less or eat more, sleep more, you can combine these things in a particular way. And then there's caffeine for you. There's uh, caffeine and other stimulants um, and other substances like L-tyrosine are great for uh, focus, so you can do things quickly, uh, more quickly, saving time. Uh, I want to tell you one other thing that I do when I wake up is that uh, I spend three minutes. I know, three minutes. It's a long time. Every day, right? But I spend three minutes, uh, and I shine uh, 660 nanometer red and 860 nanometer red infrared light uh, in the room, not directly into my eyes, but indirectly, because I don't focus focused light on my eyes. But uh, I'm older, so I, um, my retinal cells are not as uh, uh, efficient at creating energy as they used to be when I was younger. Uh, and it turns out that there was a, there's some studies that show this, uh, that if you just have three minutes of uh, red and infrared exposure to your retinas, the uh, your eyesight will improve because those cells that are really, uh, um, you know, responsible for converting all this huge amount of information into brain information, right, uh, light information into brain information for you, uh, it just has more energy. So your visual acuity increases. And I do that because my work is really highly uh, visual all the time. Uh, small wires, circuits, all the kinds of things, code, whatever. I have to see. And constantly using my eyes, and so for me, I believe that those three minutes per day translate to uh, time savings of many more than three minutes per day because I'm not, um, because I can see. And I, when I first had to start to wear glasses, it was a real time cost for me. Like, where where'd my glasses go? You know, I lose them on my lab table. Where, where I have to find them? Horrible time costs. But visual acuity and focus, uh, helps me to focus. Also, by the way, if you, it's a biological fact that if you have your hands in your view, you can focus on the thing you're working on more. That's just a hand-eye coordination thing. It's wired into our brains, so that's another biological thing. If your hands are not in your view and you have that kind of work, I don't know, maybe you can try putting your hands in your view and it might stimulate more focus. Okay, so main points, increased parallelism of these actions make tiny improvements to the highly repeated serial actions, maybe not the not highly repeated ones, but the, certainly the highly repeated ones, make small improvements and you'll buy you some time. Definitely use biology instead of decision making. Biology is always going to win. No matter what you choose to do, your body will say, you can't do this now, or you must do this now. So the more you tweak your biology, the more success you will have at, uh, at actually achieving these things. Again, you can use organizational and psychological methods we can talk about that another time. Um, and understand which things work together, which things work against each other in opposition. You can use the opposition, but you can also maximize the, uh, the synchrony. Just remember this cycle. It's really important, and you can tweak it. Okay, so these are the minutes of my talk. Here we are now. There's a few minutes now for questions, and then the green represents the future with which is what you, whatever you'll do with this information I've given you. Thank you very much. If you have any questions for our speaker, please come over to the microphone so that everyone watching online can also hear your question. No, oh, no, no, please. <laughs> this is what I've chosen to do today. Uh, so um, my uh, wife is a sleep doctor, so I've been taking lots of photos of your slides, and she's been getting kicked out, kicked out of your talk. Uh, one thing, and there's nothing she disagreed with, so, uh, but, uh, but one, if you go back one slide to the circadian rhythm. Yes, this one. She would like to draw the attention that if you notice there's times associated to the circadian rhythm. Yes. Which is artificial. Totally. And humans uh, dictate those numbers. And we live in a society in which uh, we have to interface with people and what time they want to interface, we have to comply with a lot. There's an effort going on politically to get rid of daylight savings time, which is fine. But the big question is, will we be permanent daylight savings time or standard, permanent standard time? 
permanent standard time more aligns to your circadian rhythm. So she would like you to go to the website, save standard time, oh shoot, either .com or .org, I can't remember which. So it's on my phone on my thing. But anyway, so sorry about that. But uh, uh, that is an important point that uh, daily savings time and the artificial numbers that we put on the circadian rhythm affects us uh, personally. So sorry about no, no, absolutely. I, I agree. I agree. It's totally made up. Um, and, uh, but the, the thing on this chart is that it actually goes from midnight to noon, and that's not made up because that's, you know, the, the words are made up, but the fact that the sun is up versus the sun is down, that's the thing that's, that's around this. The numbers, they are whatever they are. I know that there was a, uh, a, uh, an attempt to go to decimal time in France in like the 1800s or something, so that's just totally made up not really worried so much about clock time as, a, as opposed to where you are in, in your cycle. And there's also something I didn't talk about, which is biphasic sleep, which is something that I've tried. Uh, it's where you, again, interrupt your, your sleep cycles uh, on one of the 90 minute um, portions and sleep a lot less, but then try to do it more often during the day. And I had some success with that, um, but it's really inconvenient to take the, you know, the other, the small nap, the small sleep, there's the big sleep and the small sleep. It's inconvenient to do it um, in general, but I found a way, and the way was actually to go to metric time. A hundred thousand seconds worth of day of my, of my cycle, uh, in other words, really um, a little bit more than 27 hours was now the cycle for me, and I had to figure out how to process it so that sleep didn't occur during business hours. So then I was sleeping on the weekends, and that was okay, because then I could do more stuff at night but uh, very, very inconvenient to deal with socially. So I absolutely agree, I mean, don't do it anymore um, because I think I'm probably just as efficient now after honing uh, some of the uh, coffee and light techniques that I use. So yeah, totally made up and you should make it up for yourself. Yes. Related to the light, I have an online question from Sean LeBlanc. What do you use to get those three minutes of that type of light? You can just use a any red light therapy lamp that's available on Amazon. Um, just look for uh, 660 nanometers and 860 nanometers. Uh, try not to use highly intense lights that shine directly into your light, but uh, they just it just has to fall on your retinas. That's it. So is a 90 minute nap the best like during the day for us busy workers and maybe an eight hour sleep or more at night? Or is there any value to a 10 or a five minute nap or is such thing even possible? Um, I can't speak to what's best because it's gonna depend on your goals, right? Uh, I don't wanna spend all my life sleeping or one third of it sleeping. I can settle for a quarter or a fifth or something like this. So at least moving forward. Uh, so I uh, think that an, a 90 minute nap can work if you're, you get to that rapid eye movement stage and then you have techniques to then become attentive very quickly go to sleep quickly have that 90 minutes become attentive very quickly and um, but I, I find that that's kind of hard to time uh, so the five minute nap or the 10 minute nap as you said of course is possible because if you're if you've trained your body to become very um, efficient at going to sleep you can absolutely do that and if I and then, then the trick is waking up how do you wake up after uh, five or ten minutes so I tend not to use alarms because I don't want to interrupt my body from doing the thing that it's doing. I want that five minutes, that 10 minutes to really be worthwhile. So I'll do something like I mentioned to you before. I'll drink a cup of coffee right before going to sleep and before it, before it kicks in, I'm asleep, but then it kicks in and then I'm awake and then it's 15 minutes. It works really well and you get a lot of, you, gotta, you get a lot of uh, the benefits of actual sleep out of it, but not the rapid eye movement phase. So then you'll have to go get that and you'll do that at the big sleep later, but you can keep that big sleep down to six hours potentially, four and a half hours. So that's the benefit, that's the hack there. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I can attest to the 10 to 15 minute nap really working for me. Um, and I, I kind of go to sleep long enough to wake up and that, that works. Um, so you talked about, what is it, the blue light uh, before you wake up? Yes. Um, so um, was that 10 minutes before? I start about 30 minutes. 30 minutes? 30 okay. minutes before. I, I have this idea of making an alarm that will do that first. Yeah. Um, so what about exercise oh, uh, yeah. in the morning? So exercise is, is great. It consumes energy, but it also, it also does a lot for um, 
you know, getting your blood flowing and your, your breath. And, and so there's a, lot, there's a lot more throughput of chemical activity going on when you exercise. And there's a dopamine, there's a dopamine response, so you definitely feel more alert afterwards. I think it's a great thing if you want to do that. I don't like to do it in the morning uh, because I want to spend my time, that time uh, with analytical tasks and not cardiovascular tasks, so I tend to do it in the afternoon. So it's, it's, it's really about what you want out of it. If you think that you can benefit from um, the high alertness that you get from uh, hard physical exercise, and by the way, we're not talking about like the health benefits from, from, health ex from you know, hard exercise. There's that too, but I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about just I'm alert now and I feel great and I've, my body chemicals are all in swing, uh, and now I can do the thing I choose to do because it, that maps very well to that. Then, then you should do that whenever you want, like in the morning. Um, I, I find that uh, for me, uh, you know, I, I tend to do that m more in the afternoon, and that works for me. Um, sorry, did I to answer your question? And one last question from the Matrix chat from Obi O'Brien. How much time should one allocate bet between the 90-minute attention focus? So I would say 90 minutes because that's the modular modular uh you know time factor for the body but really you can you can push it to 30 minutes i, I would say uh maybe you could push it to 15 minutes if you were trying to do uh, if you actually did a, a, a coffee nap or just a, a regular nap that you managed to figure out how to curtail in 15 minutes i think you could you get a little bit more recharge from that type of activity than you do from just switching your focus to something else or relaxing your mind with whatever you, you know however you want to do it, listening to music or whatever but the key point is to stop focusing so that you can then refocus because you can't you just can't maintain all the dopamine levels the, the whole time you have to have a, a, a break in order to be able to then uh, rebuild that amount of focus later on so I think 15 is the probably the minimum uh, if you can do 90, you should do 90. That's what the body likes. And thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. I had a quick question. Sure. Whether the 90 minutes is, is 90 minutes for you. In other words, what kind of things are you looking at to be able to 